There we go. So welcome or welcome back to the Small Farms Winter Webinar Series, hosted by U of I Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farms team. My name is Andy, Andy Larson. I'm one of the educators. I'm housed in Oregon, Illinois, up in the northwestern part of the state. We appreciate you joining us for these webinars. As always, we especially appreciate you joining us for this final one of the season. Um, we're going to do our best to get done within the space of your lunch hour. Um, please uh, put in your questions in the chat box on the left-hand side whenever you have them throughout the course of the presentation. I will direct them to our speaker, um, or we will get to them at the end during the Q&A period. As I mentioned, this presentation is going to be recorded. I will email a link to the recorded version uh, on our YouTube channel just as soon as we get done and I can get that processed and uploaded. This week, we're going to be hearing from my colleague Nathan Johanning. Uh, Nathan is based out of Southern Illinois. Um, based out of Marion, Carbondale, Murfreesboro, that whole area he's got covered. He's got various degrees in horticulture and plant path and experience as well teaching at Southern Illinois University. He works in specialty crops. He works in agronomic crops. Uh, he grows a bunch of his own pumpkins and studies his own cover cropping systems. And he's just one heck of a nice guy with a, a, a new kiddo at home, so we appreciate him being here today to talk with us. We're going to be talking about soil management for high tunnels with Nathan Johanning. Nathan, take it away, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. You bet. All right. Well, we will jump right in. So, in our high tunnel settings, why do we need to think about soil management? Well, remember that all of our plant growth is dependent on our soils so and this has some exceptions with hydroponic production and i would say that hydroponic production also has a really good place in high tunnels so especially if you're in an urban area or for whatever reason have soils that are not conducive for whatever reason for uh, for plant growth that you would uh, consider that as an option so you can still have a high trunk tunnel and all those benefits and use that as a resource but there is a huge amount of our high tunnel production is done in soil beds so we want to consider what we need to do to be good managers of our soil <clears throat> so even though we ha do have a fair amount of control over things in the high tunnel, we still need to be mindful of the condition of our soils. So, you know, whenever I think about how soils are important to plant growth and beyond, I like this quote here, despite all of our accomplishments, we owe our entire existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Now, in obviously in a high tunnel, we have a little more manipulation with the rainfall, but still it gives us a kind of a perspective of the importance of our soils. So jumping specifically to a high tunnel. So what are some soil considerations? Uh, obviously looking at our nutrients. So we want to always maintain the nutrient levels our crop needs. So that's very important. One nuance to that can be the soluble salts in our soils due to the environment within a uh, high tunnel uh, in the limited rainfall. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, looking at the organic matter of our soil and the structure. So what can we do to amend soils? What about cover crops in our high tunnel? How can those help us? Uh, and then soil pest management. You know, weeds, diseases, insects, those are all problematic, some in greater or lesser extents in a high tunnel versus outside, but these are all things that we need to consider, some of which we can use some management techniques in the soil to help us with. So soil testing. I don't think any soils presentation in this case would be uh, would be good without having some mention of soil testing. So even in a high tunnel, we still need to test our soils just as we would out in the field. So remember, whenever you're pulling soil samples, uh, if you've been managing different beds or different areas of your high tunnel differently, then I would sample those differently, and especially until you have a, a 
a fertility history that would tell you that there, you know, that there's fairly consistent levels even despite some of those uh, other actions. So remember, different soils, uh, different amendments, fertilizer, fertigation history, those things can all change the fertility levels in your soil. So remember though that if, uh, if you have a fertilized and established a high tunnel, very often over fertilization can be problematic. So not always, but uh, we tend to, of course, want to maximize our plant growth through adequate uh, nutrient, uh, uh, providing adequate nutrients. So in some cases, we can end up with excessive nutrient levels. Now remember that uh, we can't have too much of a good thing. So nutrient uptake and imbalances can uh, occur whenever we have especially high phosphorus and potassium levels and other nutrients, but phosphorus and potassium are two that we commonly apply the most and sometimes see those those issues with. So, you know, we don't want to uh, over fertilize for those reasons. So, going back to just our basic soil test values depending on our crop. So, these are some ideal ranges for uh, your soil test results uh, for fruit and vegetable production. Uh, now, granted, we all know that there's some, uh, some deviations for this for blueberries that need more acidic soils and things. But for general, for especially for annual vegetable production, uh, these ranges are, are sufficient for good uh, crop growth. Now, whenever we start to get much above these ranges, uh, that's when we need to consider, you know, how do we need to manage our nutrient management plan for our high tunnel as we move forward. So first off, I would like to, uh, in, to give some recommendations for some resources if you're looking for uh, specific details on individual crops and uh, nutrient management. The Midwest Vegetable Production Guide does have a, a discussion on soil fertility and, and how to interpret some of your soil test results. So uh, those are some, some good resources there and they're a PDF of that can be found. And then also the uh, Kentucky Vegetable Production Guide has a really good uh, set of resources and some really good tables that specifically give you a soil test result and then they're followed up with the uh, specific nutrient ranges uh, that you should be applying given those soil test results. So those are two things that we use in field production and I would think that those uh, would be obviously perfectly applicable in a soil environment in a high tunnel as well. So just an example of those uh, Kentucky resources, you can see very straightforward soil test results listed, uh, especially for phosphorus and potassium. You can see where you fit on anywhere from low to very high, and then you can see the amount of the given uh, fertilizer or nutrient that you need to apply to uh, address those nutrient issues. So again, those are some really good resources for all vegetable production and certainly still apply for high tunnel production as well. So excessive nutrient levels. Uh, I, this is something that can happen fairly, uh, fairly easily for multiple reasons by no fault of any producer or anything uh, of those sorts, but just due to the nature of some of the, th the resources we have available, uh, these things do happen. Uh, what are some things that can cause that? Uh, to be thinking about, well, continued use of a fertilizer with a complete analysis. So that's a fertilizer that has, you know, uh, has something in as far as N, P, and K. So all three of those numbers will be something above zero. Uh, something that's very common is like triple 12, triple, triple 13. And there's others, uh, they don't have to be in equal proportions. But so, some cases, say for triple 13, we're applying that. And a lot of times we especially are using that for the nitrogen contribution. It can be a very uh, efficient way to supply nitrogen. However, oftentimes our vegetable crops don't utilize that same equal amount of phosphorus and potassium as what they do nitrogen, even though we're giving it to them equally. So over the course of two, three, five, ten years of maybe using that fertilizer source uh, and not having the balanced uptake and removal of those nutrients by our plants, you can start to get some things to, to build up. So that's where some of this can occur. 
Uh, also, continued use of some of our compost and manure, uh, that also can lead to the same issue because those are also, uh, those compounds are also uh, usually complete in nature, even though they're much lower in analysis, usually maybe, maybe at or below 1% of each of those nutrients, but they do usually contain both nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So therefore, that uh, you know, continued use of compost can is uh, very common. We'll see very high phosphorus and potassium levels in those soils. So that's something to consider. And also, we can get a buildup of what we call soluble salts. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, where a lot of our our fertilizers and also our amendments, compost and manures have uh, nutrients in salt forms in them and those naturally we, we get rid of but in a high tunnel we can uh, sometimes have those build up. Uh, so what do we want to do to lower our nutrient levels? Well the first thing is there's no really good way to lower especially our P and K levels uh, other than just growing and harvesting crops. So anytime you take a tomato out of a high tunnel with it, you're taking a given amount of nutrients. Uh, granted, uh, in the big scheme of things, we aren't taking huge amounts, and, and that's a very slow process, so to speak, as to really pull down a, a soil test level just by cropping. So if you have, say, uh, phosphorus levels that are over 500 or, uh, or over 800 even, you're going to have uh, a long time to try to pull those down to below 100. So, uh, so you can see that uh, whenever you have these complete source, sources of fertilizer, you, uh, you need to keep that in mind. Uh, so that being said, if you are uh, going through and you have uh, choosing what source to use, uh, consider something like, for example, here using urea versus triple 13 to supply nitrogen. Um, so therefore, uh, you know, urea is a single component, it just has nitrogen, so if that's all you need, then uh, that will give you just that nutrient. Now on, say, an organic production using something like blood meal, which is, is strictly mainly nitrogen-based, uh, compared to just using compost, which is more complete in nature. So those are some ideas you can use to still supply nutrients, but help to prevent some of these imbalances if they do occur. All right, so just a little bit on soluble salts in high tunnels. So uh, what is this, So, and why is it a problem? Uh, many of our nutrient sources, both synthetic and organic, uh, contain some level of nutrients that are in a salt form. For example, uh, potash, which is potassium chloride, you can see here salt is basically where we have a anion or positively charged uh, element along with a, uh, a, a cat excuse me, a cation with positively charged with an anion negatively charged and so such as potassium chloride, also uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, which is uh, NH4 and NO3, so you also have a positive and negatively charged uh, component. So whenever you have those together, that based by nature forms a salt, no different than sodium chloride or table salt. So the fact is that those salts will build up uh, in the soil, especially in a high tunnel, because we don't have rainfall, which would naturally leach those out of the field. So, uh, in a field setting and other settings, this isn't a uh, this isn't usually a problem, at least unless we have excessive uh, fertilization. But that high tunnel environment, where we're strictly uh, manipulating our watering a lot more closely, that can give you uh, can give you the uh, these impacts because we aren't flushing out enough water to really do a lot of extra leaching of these. Um, and we also combine that with the fact that we are, uh, we are fertilizing and amending our, our soils quite a bit for adequate crop growth. So below is just a, a brief table from one of, of some resources I'll, I'll share in just a few slides that gives you a gauge as to the electrical conductivity, which is how we usually measure uh, measure the soluble salts and what levels uh, gives uh, some level of issue to crop growth. 
depending on the resources you read, the, this table will look slightly different. Um, you know, some might say that uh, that maybe electrical conductivity of two is 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 too high for some crops, whereas some, in this case, you know, we see that it's a little bit uh, a little bit higher, wherefore you have some some issues. Uh, either way, the fact is, especially once you get over an EC of especially one, and especially if you know that it is increasing, that's where you're going to uh, start to have uh, have some of these issues uh, potentially uh, occur. So, if you do have you know some issues uh, through some salt buildup. Uh, what are some things you can do to not only avoid it, but potentially remediate? Uh, for one thing, do not over fertilize. So use that soil test and use the resources, especially for your phosphorus and potassium. Make sure you're supplying those in a balanced fashion that meet basically the needs of what your crop has. Uh, also, use fertilizers with a low salt, salt index. We'll talk about that in just a slide or two. Uh, so though there are some fertilizers have a greater potential to add salinity to the soil than others. Uh, so also use irrigation water that has a low salt level. So if you have, most of our water sources might not be problematic, but depending on where they're sourced, uh, maybe even some well waters and things, knowing the salinity of your irrigation water can be important because if you have irrigation water that you're using to even to try to leach these things out, but is also bringing some level of salinity with it, um, that could be problematic. So maybe you need to think about uh, how you can uh, you know, change your water source or just manipulate your system otherwise. So you can use a, uh, a soil test uh, through most of our soil testing labs. If you talk to them, you can ask to have uh, uh, soluble salt levels tested, and they can do that with a standard soil sample. Uh, so that would be the means to help determine where you're at. So if you do have uh, high levels of soluble salts, uh, so the best thing to do is to try and leach out those salts. So unlike, you know, I mentioned the or phosphorus and potassium levels, when they get high, it's hard to remove them. We can leach out the, the salts from our, our soil. So uh, one way to do this, um, if you have an opportunity in an off season, uh, remove the cover of the high tunnel and let some natural rain fall. Uh, that can very quickly, some of the research has shown, can very quickly help to pull some of those salts out. Uh, we can also, if that's not an option, uh, intense irrigation can also work. Uh, some of the research has shown, you know, at least uh, six inches of water, some six to twelve, will dramatically decrease the salinity in uh, many of our many of our soils. Uh, and but this is somewhat dependent on soil type. Our more clay soils are obviously going to hold on to things a little more uh, than what our sandier soils are. So, uh, but those are two main concepts you'd want to use if you get in that situation. Like I say, this is a unique situation because we have a, a situation where we never get rainfall on the soil, and we're just supplying just enough moisture for our crop plants. And uh, so that's where all of this comes together and can be more problematic. All right, so here's just a, a simple chart of some of the uh, salt indices of some common fertilizers. It's based off of uh, sodium nitrate, which is basically at 100% as far as the index goes. Uh, so basically, these others are in reference to, to that. So you can see ammonium nitrate being slightly higher you know, as we go to things like uh, urea and some of our other calcium or our other nitrogen sources, we have, you know, uh, levels uh, lower. Um, uh, phosphorus sources tend to be reasonably low. One thing that does have a fairly high uh, salt index is potash fertilizer, or OO60. So that that is something to, to keep in mind as well. And also with that, some of our other potassium containing fertilizers. So note with this, these are our synthetic fertilizers, but uh, composted manure and other compost can also have, uh, have very uh, high salt indexes, especially in the volumes that we're applying it in some cases. So do keep in mind that those amendments can cause issues as well. It's not just our synthetic products. 
So here are some uh, resources uh, that I would recommend if you want to, to dig a little deeper on some of the soluble salt issues. Uh, there's one here from Cornell and also uh, Penn State and the University of Georgia that all gives some, some really good feedback and perspective. There's some tables there that will give you, uh, give you the, uh, the salinity tolerance of various crops and things like that so you can uh, can see those and and use those as some additional resources to help you in if you do encounter these issues for some further reading so all right so we're back to back to the soils in general in our high tunnel so how are we going to manipulate the layout of our high tunnel uh, first off, you know, are we going to use raised beds versus no beds or just plant on a, uh, a flat bed, basically? Um, there are some advantages to raised beds, um, no different than they are in other environments. So raised beds do warm more quickly. So if we have, especially where we're overwintering crops or even trying to get an early start in a high tunnel, um, because the, uh, the beds would have that warmth from the sun on a sunny day, on not only the top surface but also on the sides as well, uh, you can get more rapid heating of those uh, of those beds. The warmer the soil, especially for things like say tomatoes and peppers, uh, the more quickly their roots will grow and therefore you'll get them established and get more growth from there. So that is an advantage to raised beds. Obviously having a fixed raised bed does kind of define your uh, your bed space, so it, it is a little more permanent. Takes you know, if you want to change the arrangement or orientation of your uh, high tunnel beds, then you know, it takes a little more work. Um, so this is pictured in a, a research and demonstration high tunnel that I have here at, at my office and when we set up the beds. Uh, so you can do a framed bed of this or many other uh, ideas or designs. Or you can, in some cases, just uh, throw up a ridge as if you were using a plasticulture type system um, and cover that with plastic or, in some cases, not, uh, not utilize plastic. And you could use that as a raised bed without a, a permanent frame. So those are all options. So whenever you're looking at now the soil that you're going to use uh, in the raised beds or in your high tunnel, uh, you have some options or you can use the native soil some of that might depend on where you're uh, where you're at what your soil type is down here in southern illinois we're, we're blessed with uh, reasonably high clay soils and also reasonably low organic matter soils so maybe not uh, as ideal as what we would think of as our most ideal soil um, so therefore maybe we want to add some amendments some options, uh, obviously compost, uh, composted manure, uh, whatever is uh, maybe available in your area, or some fertile topsoil. Maybe you have access to whether it be a uh, construction site or somewhere else that has, has good fertile topsoil. Um, that would be another option that you might want to pursue. And again, this all depends on uh, what you have access to, your specific uh, environment conditions and things like that. So those are, those are some options to consider. Now also when you're thinking about some of these options, what comes to mind is we're thinking of organic matter in the soil, whether when we're incorporating things like compost and, uh, and other amendments. So what is again as a refresher that importance of organic matter? Um, so the nutrients uh, we can get from organic matter are also very important. As that organic matter releases, we are uh, getting especially nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Um, and also organic matter uh, plays a role in the cation exchange capacity of our soil. So basically it acts as a reservoir to help hold nutrients as well, kind of keep them in reserve, so to speak. Uh, it helps us with uh, water infiltration and drainage and also water holding capacity. You know, anything we can do to, uh, to help and... Um, and improve the water holding capacity of our high tunnel soils that gives our root mass for our crops um, more leeway say if maybe we don't get them watered quite on time or other things like that it gives them some kind of a, a bank of moisture to to work with also the aspects of soil tilth are very important so organic matter it uh, 
it binds to our clay particles in our soil so it helps to prevent them from packing together which then makes a looser soil and makes less soil crusting uh, improves the tilth of the soil so it's much more loose and easy to till and also supports good root growth uh, even though we're supplying water and nutrients readily we still want our plants to have a good foundation a good root system uh, these things are all essential for that also, uh, the soil crusting is really important. Sometimes we're going to want to grow a lot of our small seeds, things like lettuce, especially carrots. Uh, those are things that uh, uh, have small seeds, some of our other greens as well. We're going to direct seed. And soil crusting can be really problematic for some of those seeds to germinate. So having a high organic matter soil where we have less chance of, of having some of that crusting can give us better stands, can get better germination and things like that. So here's an example. This is back uh, in, the, uh, in the high tunnel uh, that we have here. Just an example, when we amended our beds, we did use some uh, composted manure to uh, amend our beds. Um, and you'll note, first thing, we did have a pH issue in our native soil. So the white that you see is, is just some lime that was spread just in general, uh, just for your, uh, your reference. Uh, so what we did, in, and this is good in any raised bed, especially in a high tunnel, we had obviously a dramatic difference between what we were in bringing in and what our native soil was. Uh, and what we don't want to do in any raised bed is form basically an artificial pot, so to speak. So we want to blend the native soil with the, uh, the soil that we are amending with because we don't want to just take and add compost six inches deep and, and have a below that have just a strict layer of clay. We want it to be blended so that way we don't, our roots will be, I guess in some ways, maybe you could think tricked to continue to grow down if they have that abrupt change in, in soil type and texture. Oftentimes our roots will become, if the water and nutrients uh, are provided, they get fairly lazy and they don't root deeper in the soil. And, and always the deeper we can get our roots, the, the better crop growth we're going to have because we're exploring a greater soil volume. So how do we address that in this case? Whenever we uh, formed our beds, as you can see, you can see the, uh, the spade sticking in the bed back there. Uh, we added about maybe half the level of compost, and then we spaded. Um, so we would spade this first. So in this case, we're trying to bring some of that native clay up and incorporate it with the, uh, with the uh, this compost we're bringing in. And then so we went through and did that. And then in this case, we also would go through and till, and then we would add the additional compost. So we're blending that, trying to, as best we can, again, blend those soils uh, throughout the profile of that bed. <clears throat> so now we move from you know, our amendments to looking at cover crops in the high tunnel. So, and we transition this by one of our main benefits is that cover crops do help us to build the organic matter in our soil. Uh, and there's many, many benefits to cover crops, and I've just highlighted just a few that I think are maybe most pertinent for uh, our high tunnel discussion here today. Also, improvements in soil structure and crop uh, rooting zone. With that, uh, when it you know, I just talked about how we would uh, spade deeper to try and incorporate that. Some of our cover crops, as you'll see in some of the next slides, can really help us to also incorporate maybe some of our amended soils with uh, the native soil to improve the rooting capacity of our crops. Uh, so, and again, you know, the greater the volume of soil that those roots can explore, the more nutrients and the water they have access to. And even though we're supplying things, anything that they can do on their own, I think only is going to enhance our growth and yield as well. Uh, weed suppression, cover crops can also help us with uh, suppressing some of the weeds in our uh, tunnel settings. And we do have, remember, our, our legumes can also fix nitrogen as well. So what are some challenges uh, with some cover crops? Well, there are some, some many, many different aspects until you get used to them that you want to consider. One thing that I see a lot that I want to highlight is whenever we have cover crops that we're going to incorporate or till into the soil, 
uh, those that have a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio in their biomass can tie up nitrogen. Um, some examples of this, uh, mature cereal grains such as wheat, rye, triticale, also annual ryegrass as well. Uh, those are uh, some of our special air grass cover crops, uh, among others, can, can really tie up a lot of nitrogen in their stems, especially the larger they get, this is especially when they are uh, mature. So if we're taking, say, cereal rye that's five feet tall and we are tilling it into the soil of our bed, say we've, we've mowed it, chopped it up, and then incorporating it directly, uh, you'll get an, an extreme tie-up of nitrogen and in some cases I've seen where you almost can't supply enough uh, synthetic or amended nutrients to overcome some of the deficiencies if you're planting a very nitrogen needy plant such as a tomato, uh, even radishes and some of our greens, you can see uh, stunting and deficiencies. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, so some ideas if you're using some of the cereal grains, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is much lower whenever they're, say, 18 inches tall or shorter on our grains. Whenever they still look still very soft in appearance and the stems are not uh, very stiff and, and full of lignin, um, at that point the carbon to nitrogen ratio is much much, much lower, and therefore you get very little um, issues compared to when they're mature. So one thing that we did do in our high tunnel, and this was in some newly established beds, is we used a mix of annual ryegrass and crimson clover. Uh, so one of the things that can be done, especially in the off season, is in our, our high tunnel environment, we can actually establish cover crops at times that traditionally we wouldn't be thinking about uh, being able to establish a cover crop. These beds, we got those installed in January, and once we got them in place, we directly uh, sowed this uh, cover crop, and then uh, we it left it out not even two months, and this is the two-month uh, picture, not quite two months that you're seeing in the background. So we have a, a very... Uh, you know, a very lush amount of cover crop growth that was during, uh, which was a fairly cool or cold uh, winter time frame, but we were still able to get really good growth. And basically all we did was in with some of the other uh, winter crops, we just kept these watered. Uh, and that's what we, uh, that's what we ended up with. So, you know, even a short window of say two months or so can give you the, uh, some very good growth from some of these cover crops. And this is just one or uh, one example of the many cover crops out there that you could utilize. So looking a little closer, so when we were getting ready to terminate this cover crop, uh, we would uh, we would basically want to know, well, what is it doing for us? Uh, and just quickly to answer the question uh, from Kankakee, yes, we just broadcast that by hand, uh, and then uh, if anything, just took a, a rake and just ever so slightly kind of tamped it in and leveled it off. Um, both of those seeds need very, very shallow incorporation, so it's very easy to almost just spread them on the surface and get them established. So looking at what that cover crop did, you can see that that uh, cover crop is not very tall. I would say that if it's six inches tall, that would probably almost be stretching it. Probably four to six would be an, an average height in that uh, crop canopy. But you can see lots of roots. So what are those roots doing for us? You can see a massive amount of annual ryegrass roots. Annual ryegrass is very, um, very prolific at producing a fibrous root system. It also has the capacity to root into very acidic subsoils, which we have here in southern Illinois. So uh, it doesn't mind some of these poorly drained soils that are acid in nature that we have. And just an example of that, if you well, first look at the picture on the left, you can see that amount of root biomass from just one spadeful of, of that cover crop that we popped out of the bed. Looking next to it, if you uh, look, kind of zoom in on what would be the bottom of the picture to the left, you can see that that annual ryegrass has rooted right down into that native soil very, very easily. So it it's obviously loves the rich, fertile compost we've added, but it's, it's getting deeper and it's opening up the soil beneath 
that what we, what which we could by spading and other things. So that's where these cover crops are giving us some additional, uh, not only organic matter, because all those roots, when they die, that's just more uh, organic material to our soils, but they're also helping to improve the structure and bring some, some added benefits and, and added rooted, rooting volume for our uh, preceding crops in the future. So looking again here, this is the other perspective. So looking where that shovel hole was taken out, you can see I would say we got down to about 10 inches where we, uh, where we dug with that. Uh, and so as you look a little closer, Yes, indeed, even at the bottom, and, and I wasn't ambitious enough to go any deeper and disturb our beds anymore, but even at the bottom, 10 inches down, we still have a, a very large amount of fibrous roots that are continuing to go down and work into our soils. <clears throat> so we've talked about some of our cover crops. You know, how are we going to terminate them? Uh, especially a, a lot of our winter killed cover crops unless that we open up the tunnel and let it freeze and get cold may not uh, may not terminate themselves and some uh, naturally wouldn't be terminated anyhow uh, by just the uh, winter conditions alone so we can uh, we can till them for one thing uh, we can also use uh, mowing or roller crimper um, for either one of these tools in order for those to be most effective we, you need to use that at basically the maturity of those cover crops, which would be at pollination. So that's whenever for cereal grains, when you see the anthers on the seed head and, and pollinating. Uh, same with annual ryegrass. Clovers, whenever they're about ready to bud. Um, so that's the time frame that you need to hit. Otherwise, prior to that point, those plants are still trying to grow vegetatively. So by mowing or crimping them, they're naturally going to want to send up additional shoots and continue to grow. Uh, there are, uh, in some cases, some limited availability of some herbicides that you can utilize. So with that, I would just note that you need to be careful on the label and look at any use patterns and restrictions for high tunnel or more specifically greenhouse use if you can't find anything specifically for high tunnels. Oftentimes our high tunnels haven't quite made it onto some of our pesticide labels specifically, uh, so certainly going the more conservative route of any precautions for greenhouse use uh, would be adequate. And then also there is an option of steaming, and that's actually what you're seeing in this picture is a bed that has been steamed, and therefore uh, that was done actually the same day as the earlier pictures were taken, uh, and that also very effectively will terminate the cover crops. And we're going to talk more about steaming here in more detail in just a few slides. So I mentioned before carbon to nitrogen ratio. So do account for any nitrogen tie up with some supplemental fertilization or with a little bit of time to let some of those cover crops break down after you terminate them. Uh, so this is actually those same beds that you had seen before. Uh, you can see that uh, the picture on the left we have, this is a, a fairly newly transplanted uh, cucumber transplant for some uh, greenhouse cucumbers. Uh, you can see all the residue still remaining. We did not till that bed. All we really need to do was just uh, dig a hole uh, large enough to set our transplant, and that's really all that was necessary. Um, so with that, you can see just in comparison between the picture on the left and the picture on the right, which was taken a little bit later, you can see our picture on the left, we're a little bit yellow in nature and we were stunted ever so slightly, some of which was probably a little bit of transplant shock, even though these were in a, a four inch pot, which was fairly decent for the size that they were. Uh, all of that root mass that you saw in these earlier photos has to break down. So therefore, it's going to take a little bit of extra uh, nitrogen for our microbes to get that done. So just in, in looking at that, you can see, uh, obviously, we use some uh, a, a dissolved liquid fertilizer 
Um, in this case, just we watered by hand. You can do the same thing with drip irrigation. And very easily, our plants you know, snapped out of that very quickly, as you can see on the picture on the right. But it is something just to keep in mind as you're working with any systems. Um, I think this is actually kind of a mild case, as I've seen conditions of the carbon-nitrogen ratio issue causing much more dramatic uh, stunting than what happened in this scenario, but nevertheless, it's something to keep in mind. All right, so looking at soil pest management. So looking, there's all kinds of pests, just as we have out in the field, we can have in the tunnel and varying to varying degrees, weeds, insects, diseases, and oftentimes we tend to have a fairly limited crop rotation. Uh, so this can increase pest pressure over time. We know that there are certain crops that, that are very desirable to grow in a high tunnel, a lot of which from their ease of growing, but also their economics and return on investment. So we can very, be very tempted to continuously utilize those. Uh, tomatoes is, I think, a very common example that I encounter quite a bit. And tomatoes work great in a high tunnel. However, over time, we can get some pest buildup, especially in that case, disease buildup. So looking uh, from there, what can we do in our high tunnels to basically uh, minimize some of these pest problems? Um, there are some pesticides and there will be times, especially for uh, insects, um, that we are going to, uh, that we are going to need to try and uh, use those pesticides to, uh, to manage them. We can have insect outbreaks, especially things like aphids, uh, white flies, some cases spider mites can be very problematic and we do need to have some, some product, whether it be uh, a synthetic or an OMRI approved product. There's uh, both available in many of our scenarios. Um, with the uh, with also the beds themselves, we can look at plastic mulch. Uh, we can use that for weed control and also uh, as a sideline benefit, we do get added soil warming. So you can, uh, can see in this picture here, you can see some of the beds that have been covered with black plastic. In this case, this is the same black plastic you would utilize uh, for plastic culture out in the field. It's simply laid over the beds. Usually use a staple gun in this case to affix it to a, a wood frame bed. It can also just be covered, the edges can be covered with soil as you would uh, in field production if you were doing this with uh, just ridged beds that don't have any specific form. And also we can use steaming as I mentioned before to help manage some of our pests. So you can see here, this is, in addition on this image, they're also steaming some of the beds. So that's another tool that is out there that's been researched that we can utilize. So what is soil steaming and what are we exactly talking about? Well, the goal of this is actually pasteurization of the soil. So this is very similar to the use of steam on some of our greenhouse media, where we're trying to minimize our insects, uh, diseases, especially uh, seedling diseases in greenhouse media, and also any weed seeds that might be in uh, in that media. So, what we're our goal is, at least in in our case of using it in high tunnels, we're trying to achieve uh, bed temperatures of around 160 degrees at the coolest point of the bed, and trying to hold that for around 30 to 60 minutes, depending on bed conditions, that kind of varies on the, the times that we're looking at. So what do we get from utilizing this technology? Um, so this is, we basically get disease suppression for not all, but a, a large portion of, uh, of our, our, our plant uh, pathogens we can, we can have good suppression with. Uh, so that is uh, that's something that can be very helpful. There's many soil-borne uh, soil-borne diseases, especially of tomatoes, that can be extremely problematic. And another thing I think is more definitive that we see is weed suppression. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that can be a a very very direct and uh, profitable benefit that you can get from the use of steam. So what is uh, what are we doing with the steam we're using in the picture on the top left? 
We're using a portable steam gem generator to produce steam. And then uh, if you look to the right of that, you can see we are laying some, uh, in this case, a steam sock out over the bed to deliver the steam. And then if you go directly down from that, you can see we tarp that. And then we'll use some soil thermometers in those beds to track where we are going. Uh, on average, uh, at least with this setup, you're, it's going to take maybe an hour and a half or a little bit more from start to uh, finish on a given bed to, to steam it and achieve those goals that I listed here above. So, I mentioned this is technology, but it's really not new technology by any way, shape, or form. This has been around uh, really in the United States since the uh, late 1800s, commercially utilized. Uh, this is just one example uh, of where it's it was utilized in, uh, in tobacco and other crops, and which includes some other vegetable crops. Uh, as you can see, this publication is from 1918 from the USDA, so we can see that this is not a, a technology that is new, uh, but it is something that is, uh, is very much applicable to us in, uh, in our production systems. The nice thing about it is this is something that is kind of broad spectrum, no matter whether you are more of a conventional grower or an organic grower, steam is still, I think, a, a highly sought after uh, tool in trying to manage your uh, high tunnel operation. Uh, so that's just, uh, I say, one of the things that is, is very uh, important to note about it is that it does kind of cross uh, various spectrums of production. So what are we achieving here? You can see that we are looking at uh, trying to achieve a temperature of around 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're, we're minimizing soil insects and most of our, our plant pathogenic fungi. And we're also getting most of our weed seeds, we find, at this. And especially in the top layers. Now, as we get deeper in the soil, if we maybe work the soil, we can sometimes bring up some additional weed seeds. Uh, but we are removing a lot of these uh, otherwise problematic pests from our production system. And especially in a high tunnel environment where I would always call this prime real estate for producing crops, this has uh, a lot uh, a lot of valuable uh, implications. So I would be uh, remiss to mention the, uh, anything regarding soil steaming and the research that's been done without uh, remembering Jeff Kindhart. He was a, a former research associate that worked at our Dixon Springs Ag Center. Uh, we lost Jeff just last year. Uh, however, uh, Jeff was the one that was kind of the brainchild behind some of the recent research that was done in the high tunnel settings and was instrumental in in horticulture production overall, but especially in steaming among many, many other things. Uh, so uh, one quick question, does this, uh, does this kill beneficial microbial activity? Uh, that, that is one thing that is somewhat of a downside because it is, steam is somewhat broad spectrum. Uh, however, uh, so we are minimizing that. Uh, one thing that is a new uh, technology that we are looking into is can we use some of a, uh, a biofertilizer? So can we add steam and then can we add some beneficial uh, microbes that we know have positive plant uh, relationships to maybe uh, help to reinfest and reincorporate into these production systems? Uh, do remember, though, even though we're minimizing a lot of them, we are far from being in a sterile environment, and these microbial populations very rapidly will, with moisture and adequate temperatures and things, will regenerate for what has been uh, maybe reduced during the steaming. So this image is, so we're looking at some high tunnel beds here. This is some peppers that were grown. This, so this is an example of the bed that has been steamed, and we compare that with the uh, same uh, setting, peppers planted, and this was a non-steam bed. Uh, obviously, we can't see the disease impacts, but I think the weed implications are, are fairly significant, and especially given the size of our peppers and also the weeds, and anyone that's maybe had an opportunity to pull weeds in any fashion, especially in a high tunnel, can very rapidly uh, gain some appreciation for this. 
All right, more of the same. Looking at the bed in the front, uh, was it not steamed? This is in tomato production. And then we look in the back, we have a steamed bed uh, in this, that uh, same scenario. So you see, again, uh, almost complete uh, weed control. There are a few weeds, especially uh, yellow nut sedge, and sometimes morning glories due to in the morning glories some larger seeds that we don't catch with steaming. But annual things such as some of the crabgrass and purslane you see here, uh, we take out fairly easily. So the research uh, results from this study basically did determine that uh, compared to hand weeding, uh, steaming more than paid for uh, paid for itself as far as the time, materials, and labor it took to steam these beds. Uh, so that was uh, one thing that was was that we did. Uh, realize a, a very significant benefit just from the weed control, not even necessarily looking at uh, some of the benefits from uh, pathogen suppression and things like that. And so uh, this is definitely a, uh, another scenario. In this case, compared to some of the summer weeds, these are uh, the winter annual weed growth in the beds in the high tunnel. Uh, this is specifically helpful for those that grow greens. And I would think most, uh, most importantly, if you're growing carrots in a high tunnel, uh, I know personally, um, weeding carrots, especially when they're young, is, is not something that I think is highly desirable on any level. Uh, and so to think that you could have, uh, you know, virtually, uh, you know, 95 plus percent weed control, uh, especially on some of our direct seeded and very small plants, uh, I think is, is a big benefit. Uh, and we, we've utilized this with carrots in our high tunnel here. And, and with the steam, we've seen, you know, uh, fairly minimal weeding. The only thing sometimes you have is a few weed seeds that maybe happen to, uh, to blow in um, some things like mare's tail and other windblown seeds and those that are maybe persistent. But compared to the scenario you see uh, in this picture, that's uh, I don't mind pulling out maybe one or two weeds every foot in the bed compared to trying to wade through this. Uh, and granted, this is in peppers. You know, peppers are reasonably easy to weed around compared to uh, some of these other crops I mentioned. So overall, trying to recap everything we've touched on in a, a kind of a variety of production related topics, all tying back to the soils in our high tunnel. Uh, looking at our nutrients. So do use your soil test. You know, you, you're still growing in the soil, whether it's under cover or in the field. So you need to know where your nutrient levels stand. Uh, and therefore, don't over apply fertilizers. Uh, even though it's on a small scale, uh, dollar for dollar, we, we may not, that may not be the hugest investment by adding a couple extra pounds of fertilizer in a high tunnel, but some of the cost and challenges of remediation can, can be more than worth, uh, worthwhile for you to take that extra time to kind of know where you stand. Um, so that's some, uh, some, really, uh, some really valuable things to consider, especially given the, just the scenario of the environment of our high tunnels. Uh, again, we can, if we're, we're careful, we can certainly uh, apply these, uh, apply fertilizers and amendments and have good growth and, and not have soluble salt issues, but you know, a few even maybe some fer fertigation miscalculations can, can kind of change things for us if we're not careful. So do consider your bed layout and soil amendments uh, for your, so what, especially cover crops, you know, what are some ways we can use those? I think there's lots of, there's lots of people doing some additional research. If you do a search, you can find other research on cover crops and there's certainly things that I would personally like to look uh, more into on the benefits and what we can gain from those. And also soil pest management. So what are some tools you can do to help manage the, uh, the pests that are most common uh, and help your production system, especially where you have more of a monoculture and a single crop system? You know, I think uh, we've talked about steaming as a, uh, as a resource and, and some other management tools. Um, so this is, this is where uh, I think there are some potentials. Uh, and just a little more, I see the question, a few quick notes since I have a few extra minutes here on steaming. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, so a steamer like shown in this picture uh, is, 
is not usually cost effective for an individual grower to have. Um, so that is a downside. That steam model, and this is maybe slightly dated as I didn't look the current price, but a few years ago, it'd be somewhere between maybe twenty-two and twenty-five thousand dollars. So that's obviously more than than what, unless you're a very large-scale grower, you would want. Could there be some cooperative opportunities? Or could there be, uh, the original idea would be, uh, you know, maybe for someone like uh, some of the uh, soil and water districts or USDA that has championed some of the high tunnel uh, support programs uh, through EQIP um, with, with the, uh, you know, kind of the, the proven results of this, could we get some of those organizations to have some to rent available? Because I don't know that typically you can find them uh, for, uh, for rent as easily, um, just uh, as you would maybe other things at a, at a rental facility. But uh, these uh, soil and water districts uh, with in partnership with the USDA often have things like no-till drills, tree planters, uh, pasture uh, renovators and things like that available for a similar scenario where you would uh, they would purchase them or get a grant to purchase them and then they would be available for rent because you really don't need to uh, uh, you really don't need to utilize this for very long you are on a decent in an average size farm a couple days of, of steaming can get get quite a few high tunnels taken care of and you may not have to do that um, every year even depending on your system so you you could go maybe two, three, maybe even more years and still re realize some benefits. So, uh, so I think there's some potential there. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, I don't think we've officially gotten any buy-in on that. Um, uh, there have been some, sometimes locally, where we've done some demonstrations and other things on farm. But, but I think that's something that um, that we would be happy to try to support if we could get some uh, willing ears into making those available, say, in different portions of state or region. So lastly, I want to uh, make a plug for, uh, for the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter, which is a commercial grower newsletter uh, to that, uh, that is provided for, uh, by University of Illinois Extension. Myself and my colleague Bronwyn Ailey are the editors, and we have the whole team of local food systems, uh, small farms educators, along with uh, horde educators and some of our campus specialists that are contributing to this, looking at regional updates on what's going on in Illinois, uh, pest and production information. We try to keep it very timely, so things that you uh, might need to know at a certain given time for a given crop or things to watch out for, or just some uh, uh, short uh, research summaries, say talking about maybe steaming research or other high tunnel research that's going on. I know I report quite a bit on the, the current goings on in the, the research high tunnel here in Murfreesboro. So uh, this is available. You can see the website there. Uh, it's also in the chat box uh, that you can download uh, and look at the current issue. If you want to get a quick email when a new issue comes out, you can just send an email to myself and we can uh, add you to the email list. If you uh, don't have email, which maybe doesn't affect too many of the people in this audience given a webinar, but uh, if you do like that paper copy, we do have those available. We just, uh, just uh, contact me. We just need enough money to pay for copies and postage. So with that, uh, I think I am ironically enough right on time. And if we have any questions, <laughs> um, we will, uh, I'll be happy to entertain them. Uh, can you do no-till in high tunnels? Well, you certainly, uh, you certainly can. Um, Obviously, you saw the, the example of the cucumbers. I showed you those uh, slight nutrient issues. That was uh, what I would call a no-till environment. Um, you know, that bed was steamed, as you saw in the earlier picture, and we, we took a, uh, a, a spade or a garden trowel and dug a hole big enough for a transplant, planted in, and uh, the cucumbers didn't look back from there. So... Uh, I think that is certainly an option, and there's there's probably could be a whole other discussion about how of different techniques we could utilize to uh, make other no-till systems work, or just you know um, maybe change how we till or limit tillage use in in high tunnels. Any thoughts about using boiling water to kill weeds instead of using a steam machine? 
Uh, all right, so you can certainly use, using boiling water to, to kill weeds is certainly effective. Obviously, you want to, uh, and also flaming can be an option. Typically speaking, um, uh, obviously you need the water to be really hot, so depending, and I'm sure that there's innovators out there that you could, uh, you could take and uh, create a way to have constantly hot water um, and be able to apply that to beds because hot water uh, and boiling water will will kill weeds now with that or flaming especially on the flaming the larger the weeds the harder it's going to be to kill because you have to actually destroy the tissue at all the growing points uh, especially on your grasses you have to get down to that low growing point in order to to have effectiveness now maybe you do two doses of boiling water that might be you know an option but sometimes you don't get as effective of kill and what you don't get is you don't get the impacts on the weed seed bank so remember in the images i so showed of the peppers and tomatoes by by heating that um by heating that that soil in in this case in a raised bed you can get you know at least you know four inches down you're 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 basically killing all those weed seeds so even if you till a little bit you're not bringing those weed seeds up Hot water doesn't get that bed warm enough, long enough to actually have dramatic impacts on the seed bank. It might have a, a, a minor impact on any seeds, maybe in the top eighth or maybe quarter of an inch of the soil, but on any, especially of our, our weed seeds that are, are slightly larger, you're, you're not going to have enough heat there. That's where the steam, that's why we bring it up to temperature and hold it there. Uh, for at least 30 minutes to to get that uh, that kind of pasteurization type effect. No different than how they how they would pasteurize milk on uh, you know commercially available milk. Time for one last one, Nathan. All what right. are your thoughts about steaming and even boiling water and soil tilth and soil health, especially as it pertains to beneficial microbes? Uh, so uh, as far as the tilth of the soil. Um, so we're not um, we're not really going to be influencing as much of the tilth, um, at least the tilth that's due to the organic matter of the soil. Now, not to get too deep into this, we do have some beneficial, uh, of course, beneficial fungi which aid in providing uh, good aggregate stability and things. So uh, our microbial life. Uh, yes, we are. We are. We are providing some impact to. Um, and and being a person who's done many soil health presentations, that's kind of the the downside in some of this. Uh, however, a lot of these populations, if given the chance, can can rebound. We actually have uh, some research going on on some biofertilizers with a bed that we steam to remove others, and then adding. A, uh, a some beneficial bacteria to, that are known to help the plant nutrient and plant water relations and trying to basically add those in to inoculate our soils with the good guys and and try to use those as a benefit um, this all being said if we look at the grand scheme of things being that we're basically using water as our delivery tool compared to all the other products uh, whether it be synthetic or even um, uh, OMRI approved pesticides and other things, you know, I think how much more basic can we get than using water as a as basically a pest management tool? Right. So uh, I think the the safety aspect from that as from that is and the the other impacts, especially on weeds, I think has some some really good benefits. And I think with the new technology on biofertilizers and some of our amendments, I think we could overcome even some of those, those issues. But it's a very valid point to consider. So, Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there, Nathan. Uh, many, many, many thanks to Nathan Johanning, our local food systems and small farms extension educator based out of Murfreesboro, for a great presentation on his experience and expertise and the demonstration that he does down by his office. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar, this final webinar of the 2017 uh, Small Farms Winter Webinar Series. Hope you got some good actionable information and intel from this. You're going to get an email from me shortly with a link to the archived webinar uh, that will be housed on our Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel. It, of course, will also have that tiny little short evaluation of the webinar that you just watched. If you could fill that out in the space of you know 30 to 60 seconds, we'd appreciate it. An awful lot. We use your feedback to shape our future webinars. 
with that, you guys, glad to have you here. We're done for the season. Look for some more webinar-based educational programming uh, from our team over the course of this year. And uh, I wish you a very, very productive growing season in 2017. Have a great one, you all.